I is, is wrong. Mm. Again, listen again. You, you, you wouldn't use the base of an Adam Brett in the same sentence. In the, um, the main uh, ways, for example, when the person wants want, um, to say it, answer evasive or Edinburgh, these words, uh, they are synonyms? Synonyms. Syn come? Synonyms? Yeah. Synonyms. No, they're not. No, they're not synonyms. I'll spell it for you. Right. It's a good question, though. S uh, synonyms. That's the word you wanted there, right? Synonyms. 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 It's very difficult. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Synonyms. Synonyms, 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 yeah, synonyms, synonyms, synonyms. yeah, so they're not, they're not synonyms, but there's overlapping meaning, both them. Um, are conveying the idea of not giving all the details when you're communicating, right? So in that sense, they both overlap. Not giving all the details. In that sense, they're, they're, they're the same. But with Adam Breit, I am not giving you all the details because it's not relevant. Okay. Um, where an evasive, the details are relevant, but I don't want to tell you the details. I, I, I am being deceptive. Mm -hmm. When I'm being evasive okay. or yeah, deceptive. Maybe All the details might be embarrassing for me. So I don't want to tell you them. In Edinburgh, it's just not relevant. <clears throat> Sir, at the beginning, uh, you told us that uh, Edinburgh is not like a common word, yes? Yeah. So in that case, what will be like the common word or maybe like the synonym? that is more used than this one? Good question. The question is, what would be like the synonym? Yeah, no, I, I, is... I know I know what your question is, yeah. Ah, okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm saying it's a good question. And I'm thinking, and I think the best thing would be to say outline. So, Instead of saying, saying, I, you know, adumbrated my plans for the summer, I would just say I outline my plans for the summer. That would be the common word. Okay. No, sir, come again, please. Which one? Okay, so I could say, you could say to me, hey Al, what are your plans for the summer? And I could say, I have no detailed plans, but I would quite like to go away on holiday, maybe because of COVID, you know, not far away, you know, just within the country somewhere. That's the outline of my plans. So I'm, out, I'm outlining my plans. 
that would be the same as saying I adumbrated my plant. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thanks. The final comment, which I've already made, but I'll just reinforce it by repeating it, is you would use adumbrate more in writing than in speech. Uh, Alan, this, this answer, this, you, your, your, your example is, is adumbrate? Adumbrate? Adumbrate, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. The same or another example for the same case, you you could give answer evasive. No. Um, if you say I'm being evasive. There's nothing negative about adumbrating or outlining. There's no negative association with that. But if you, if you, if I am being evasive, I, there's a negative connotation there because I'm trying to hide something. I'm typically trying to hide something. When I'm, yeah, I am. When I'm, I'm not hiding anything if I'm outlining or adumbrating. I'm just not giving you details because they're not relevant. But but if I'm being evasive, I'm I'm keeping back something deliberately. Okay, thank you. Clear? Clear. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on. Right. So here I don't think we've done this. Bold. Have we done that word? Anyone? I'll write it in the chat. Um, this is so let's 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 look at what the dictionary says. The dictionary says to be a sign of something that will happen in the future usually something very good or bad. Here's examples. These recently published figures bode ill, or these recently published figures uh, do not bode well for the company's future. The hurricane bodes disaster for those areas in its path. So bode is a statement about something happening in the future. And, you know, it could be positive or, or negative, right? We usually use it in a negative context, but it could be either. Um, the injection of funding into the university bodes well for the future. That's it in a positive sense. So it, it points to the state of something in the future. That's what bold means. Um, but um, what if they come under a supposition or, re or reality, whatever. You understand me? No. Just, okay. just, just, when, just, just repeat. Just repeat yourself, Alida. For example, when you 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 say whatever situations both, uh, this situation um, could be uh, really or. Uh, see or suppositions, accusations, algo así, something like that. 
it could be any situation, right? It could be any, any circumstance, and it could be positive or it could be negative. Yeah? It could be positive or it could be negative. You know, like we, we could be chatting about the political situation in Colombia, and there could be, let's say, a change in government, and you could say, it bodes well for the future, I'm happy. Or you could say, I'm not really happy, it doesn't bode well. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's one or the other, it's either good or it's bad, but it's a statement about the well-being of something in the future. You, not usually a person, but it could be a person, but it's normally, it's normally some form of entity, like a company um, or a country, something like that, generally. Or, you, or, or your opinion, personal? Your personal situation, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to take these drugs because of my uh, sciatica, but actually they have side effects and it doesn't bode well for me. I'm a bit worried about it. Does that make sense? Hey, slow me down if I'm talking too fast, by the way. Just slow me down. Just say, whoa, Alan, hold your horses, slow up. If I'm talking too fast, okay? Don't, don't allow me to talk too fast. I, I know I have a tendency to do that. Just slow me down. Okay? Okay, so we've done bode, and bodes well. Right. Here's a good word. Megalomania, megalomania, six syllables, megalomania. <laughs> you have it's easy to pronunciation. Yeah, megalomania. So what does this mean? An unnaturally strong wish for power and control or the belief that you are very much more important and powerful than you really are. Okay, so it's, this is a word to describe somebody who wants to be all powerful, right? They've got an innate desire for that, right? Um, or maybe they think they're powerful when they're not really, but it, whichever one of those two it is, it's a bit unnatural. How, do you guys, let me write that word in, in, in the chat, right? So, mega, mega, lomania. And to describe a person who has this attribute, we would describe them as a megalomaniac. Thank you. Thank you. A megalomaniac. Right? So, somebody who they just nothing will do except that they're in complete control. So you, 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 could, you could really say almost all dictators are like this. That's what makes them no, dictators. We can, can we say Hitler was a megalomania? You can. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. But you could be a you, you could be a megalomaniac as, as a headmaster of a school. It doesn't have to be a country, you know. Okay. So that's megalomania and megalomaniac. And an example could be the president from Venezuela. He's one. Megalomania, see, megalomania, megalomania. Yeah, 
I don't know him personally, but. <laughs> Someone who's a naturally strong wish for power, blah, 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 right? Examples, for God's sake, don't let this megalomaniac become president, right? Okay. Some people actually call me a megalomaniac because of my ambitious ideas. The department is run by a rapid militarist right-wing megalomaniacs, right? Not a good look. It's also good for megalomaniacs who want to make the world all theirs. The head teacher is a pill-popping megalomaniac, but also strangely inspiring. There you go. That covers the full gamut. There's a good word, gamut. The full gamut of meaning. You come across the word gamut? That's a good word. Right, that's a word, right? So I always apply the Elham test. Every word I teach you, right? And the Elham test is how popular is this? How common is this word? Is it really rare? Well, everybody in Britain or America would, in any English speaking word, would understand the, the meaning megalomania. And gamut. That you're referring America to the United States, right, teacher? Yeah, that's correct. And I must remember the IO test. <laughs> Don't call <laughs> the United States of America America because South America, yes, yeah, America, America. The rest of I'd America, <laughs> we are I know, like that. I know, I know. But you see, it's really hard to get out of the habits of a lifetime. But uh, so forgive me. Forgive me, Eo. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I forgive you everything. <laughs> so, so, gamut. Yes, sir. So, what, what I mean is that, uh, so that country is, uh, or I don't know, so it's based on this megalomaniac because so they believe uh, in themselves like a powerful country that can control everything, more or less, right? Yeah. It's mostly, mm -hmm. it's not so much a country wanting to rule others, like China wanting to take over the world. It's not that. Or America. It's not that. It's to do with an individual. So you could probably say Trump, Donald Trump was a megalomaniac, right? He wanted to, he wanted power. And even when he was voted out, he still tried to hold on to power, right? So that's behavior commensurate with a megalomaniac. So was he a megalomaniac? I think he was. I think he is. See, by this word is different from, for example, from self-esteem or self, uh, like a selfish um, country, or so in that example, uh, because it's more related to the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, when we talk about self-esteem, you only ever talk that about individuals and We usually use that in a negative context. We usually say so-and-so has low self-esteem. You could say they have high health self-esteem, but we don't typically say that. You could say that. So, but a megalomaniac would certainly have very high self-esteem. Yeah. And, right. and also because it's more related to the power, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thanks, Tisha. Right, so let's do gamut, right? So gamut, we use gamut in the context of art and colors. So you talk about the gamut as being the full breadth of colors that can be represented on a computer screen would be the gamut. The gamut. And, and what I said, we use this word, not scientifically like I've just done, but we use that word metaphorically to describe the full breadth of ideas. Okay, so let's look this up, gamma. The whole range of things that can be included in something. In her story, she expresses the whole gamut of emotions from happiness to sorrow. There you go.
the gamut or the whole gamut, the gamut. It would always have a definite article in front of it. The. This is another good expression, run the gamut of something. To experience or show the whole range of something. Johnson has run the gamut of hotel work from porter to owner of a large chain of hotels. Common expression. Good one to know. Okay. That's gamut. We've done Adam Braid. Here's another good word. I'll write it in the chat first of all to capture it. Acumen. Teacher, but a uh, gamut is like a common word. Gamut is common. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Common. Yeah. Okay. So acumen. Before I press enter, does anyone know what this word means? Acumen? Angeli? No? Okay. Uh, teacher, I, <laughs> I feel like I am in a new language class. All the words <laughs> are new and hard. <laughs> I've never even had any of them. Okay. Same here, teacher. I have never <laughs> seen these words. Okay. So remember, we're learning good vocabulary. These are good words to learn. But remember, in us interacting, like we could be talking about flowers, right? You know, or science. We could be doing a physics lesson. Eo, right? If I knew about physics, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Yes. Because sir. you see, so, we're still learning English by me talking to you guys and you answering questions, and yeah, yeah. So we're still doing English, but we have to be in it. And so, so, so when it all clicks, I, like I what, what, one day, of... one day, it's just all going to click, click, and you will feel confident in your English and you'll happen to have a nice rich vocabulary at the same time. Yeah, yes, right. So I was uh, I was thinking about this uh, gamut uh, definition because it is something related to physics in colors, yeah? Like the spectrum of colors in light. Exactly. But, but <laughs> and I don't know, so I, I never seen like the specific words as gamut. So I mean, in the way in which it's spelled, I thought that was writing in a different way. And I usually say the spectrum of colors or something like that, but never the gamut. <laughs> yeah, so. So. See, if I say gamut of colors, let me do the American spelling. A color gamut describes the range of colors within the spectrum of colors that are identifiable by the human eye. There you go. There you're getting the difference. So the spectrum, from a physics point of view, as a physicist, you say it's the spectrum. But the human eye can't see everything. And so what the human eye can detect is the gamut. Isn't that interesting? Yes, sir. Just the visible range. 
Okay. So, as a wee test, I'll say explain the difference between gamut and spectrum. Not now, but you all can do that later. You know, write a sentence. Write a sentence that explains what I've just explained. As, a, as an exercise, okay? What is the difference between gamut and spectrum? Going back to the metaphor, I could say, you could say, Alan outlined the full spectrum of ideas. And I could also say, Alan outlined the full gamut. I'm saying the same thing. I'm really saying the same thing. Because the difference between gamut and spectrum, as explained on that web page, is quite technical. So the people who talk about gamut are artists, right? Because they talk about, they're only interested in having colors that people can see. And the other, the other word they use a lot is palette. Like that. See that word there, palette? So yes, sir. What is the palette of colors you're going to use for this design of this document? Or what is the palette of colors, the set, the set of colors, the finite set of colors they're going to be used to decorate this home or this living room? Yeah. But so, these ones are more related to the, like, to the fashion and yeah. style, maybe? Yeah. But also in the architecture? I don't know yeah. how to yeah. say that. Yeah. So, so spectrum would be the widest grouping. And then gamut will be smaller, what the eye can see. And then palette is what somebody's chosen who is you know, uh, someone who's into color. Right? Okay, moving on. Let's go to acumen then. Acumen is a great word. And if I said that you had good acumen, I would be complimenting you. Here's what it means. Skill in making correct decisions and judgments in a particular subject, such as business or politics. There is one thing that Cambridge Dictionary, with all due respect to Cambridge Dictionary, are leaving out. And that is, it's the ability to make the decisions quickly. That, they're missing that there, but I think is an important bit of that. Ability to make correct judgments, skill in making correct decisions. Let's look at a different. Let's let's look at a, di a different definition. Uh, define acumen. Ah, I see. Look, look, see that. That was missing from Cambridge, right? That's an important aspect of it. Because if you take forever to make a decision, you know, like you know, there could be disaster, right? So, so making good decisions, it's important that it's done in a reasonable time window. For example, so, teacher, um, it could be the, the manager is acumen to make the business decisions in the company. Exactly. Or the commander of the submarine must have good acumen because he needs to make the right decisions. And if he makes the wrong decision in the time period, he could crash into an underwater mountain. So you, you need to have acumen. That's how we pronounce it, acumen. So the emphasis is on that first syllable, acumen. Acumen. Yeah. 
Say it again, Alida. Practice it. Acumen. Acumen. That's right. Okay, so is everyone clear on that word? Yes, sir. So, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I was uh, thinking about like the um, antonym of these words because when we say making a decision, I say so. I really opposite of this. Um, I don't know. This is a noun, right? Alibi. Did you say alibi? Did you no, say alibi? Alib no, no, not alibi. No. Um, let's look, let's uh, look up antonyms. I came in antonyms. I can't, I can't, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, so it's making some suggestions here. Ignorance, insensitivity, stupidity, misinterpretation, Mistake, misunderstanding, denseness, ineptness, obtuseness. So there's no one word there that's just acumen doesn't have a very good antonym, right? Mm. You know, like you can say that somebody whose who's acumen is smart, yeah, smart. But you could be smart and not have acumen. Because you can be smart and not have common sense. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Yes, you know, so Somebody can be I just... <laughs> like we so we sometimes describe people as book smart, right? Mm -hmm. book, book smart. Um, there's a few people on the call tonight, and I know they're book smart, right? They're book smart. They're good at exams. They're good at remembering things, right? They're book smart. But to be a well-rounded person, you also have to have common sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you want to be, you know, in an ideal world, book smart and common sense is good. Acumen would be all of those things, plus the ability to make fast decisions. So in my experience in life, right, people who are introverted, tend to have good acumen because they often have the conclusion before you've understood what the question was, right? They're just like, know the answer. There are two steps ahead of you, right? Acumen. Acumen is a very good attribute and quality in any person. Okay, I think we've done acumen to death. We have done it to death. We've done that expression before. We've done it to death means that we've killed it, right? We've, we're going to move on to another subject now. Okay? All right? Right. So where were we going to go after acumen? Uh, I did bode, megalomania. Yeah, here's a great word. And this word will be new for all of you, I am sure, we'll just stay with uh, this dictionary for now. But you think it's an American dictionary? And we'll write this word in here, right? It's esconced. Ensconced, oops, I spelled it wrong. So, does anybody, has, had anybody heard of this word before? It's new for you all, isn't it? Ensconced. This is a great word, right? It's very descriptive. What does it mean? It's an adjective. Let me write it in here before I forget myself. Ensconced. It means settled securely or snugly, or it means sheltered or hidden. Let's look at the examples. The old house still has its original, elaborately ensconced fuse box with an oak frame, decorative wrought iron bosses, and a clear 
glass panel. Don't love that example. The only people hurt by education reform are teachers who aren't up to snuff and ensconced administrators who can't justify their existence. Okay, this is, this is quite a good statement. First of all, before we go into the detail, I want to look at this expression here, aren't up to snuff. Aren't up to snuff. Now that's probably gobbledygook. Is that gobbledygook to people? Aren't up to snuff. This is a colloquial expression, right? Which means not acceptable or satisfactory, not attaining to a particular standard. Your papers have been very good all semester, but frankly, this one is not up to snuff, right? How's your dinner? It's really not up to snuff in this, right? This expression is one that I sense my teenage children would not understand. And they're not teenagers anymore, they're in their 20s, right? They wouldn't know that expression. It's a little bit, feels a little bit oldy worldy. Not up to scratch, not up to snuff, means the same thing. Okay, so that, I'm just doing that one in passing since it was used to define the other word, right? Not up to snuff. In the Elham test, it's not super common, not rare, but not super common. Okay, ensconced. The only people hurt by education reform are teachers who aren't up to snuff. So teachers who are no good. And ensconced administrators who can't justify their existence. So, we all know what bureaucracy is. Does everybody know what a bureaucracy is? Yeah. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Angela, define, define, uh, Elham's giving me a thumb up as well. So Angela, you, your mic's open. So tell everybody what a bureaucracy is. Okay, I don't know the definition exactly, but it's actually a British thing. Like the we Indian have like uh, uh, borrowed it from Britain, India. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it's the officers, government officers, who serve the people. Yeah. On the behalf of government, it's like that. Yeah, yeah, you're in the right ballpark, right? So a bureaucracy doesn't have to be government. It, governments are bureaucracy, right? But it's basically any situation where there's lots of paperwork and people handling paperwork, right? That's what a bureaucracy is. So like government departments can be bureaucracies, right? you know, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see in education, education can be a real bu bureaucracy. So a bureaucracy is generally a negative thing. It's not seen as a good thing. And so it has lots of administrators in it, right? Who are doing this admin, doing this paperwork. And so this statement is saying that, you know, education reform is a good thing, but teachers don't like it and administrators don't like it. Administrators don't like it who are ensconced now, they're too settled um, and, you know, and they're too comfortable. Um, 
ensconced is being used in a negative sense here, but it doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be. It can it can describe, you know, you know, a little rabbit was ensconced in its warren, you know, you know, a nice beautiful picture, right? It's the idea of being protected. And safe. Sieges are fortified positions that have been used from time immemorial to starve, demoralize, and physically weaken the ensconced combatants. So this the combatants, the ensconced combatants are people who felt safe in their position, but and generally they are safe, but obviously if they're if they're sieged then that becomes a problem. So that's ensconced. It's not an easy word to say, even for us um, natives, right? En ensconced. It's important to see that N there, ensconced. Ensconced. Right. Um, I'll do one more Allen word and then we'll do some more simpler things. We've been going for an hour. All right, this is a really good word to know, a priori. Why have I spelt it wrong? Have I spelt that wrong? I can't see why I'm spelling that wrong. What? Okay. A priori, some people like to separate the A and the P, right? Because it's obviously coming from Latin. Related to or denoting reasoning or knowledge which proceeds from theoretical deduction rather than from a observation or experience. A priori assumptions about human nature. Now, a priori assumptions is a statement that is often made. A priori assumptions. The idea of a priori is it's before A way based on theoretical deduction rather than empirical observation. Right, so neither of these guys are saying before. Interesting. Let's go to Cambridge Dictionary. Reading to an argument that suggests the probable effects of a known cause or the general principles to suggest likely effects. It's freezing outside, but you must, you must be cold. It's an example of an a priori reasoning. You know, because of one thing, then another thing. Um, so like, you know, I could maybe say, it would be that maybe people who live in a communist country would be unhappy. That would be my a priori perspective, but I could be wrong in that. You know, and I'm sure I am wrong in that because I'm sure you can be happy in a, in a communist country too. But it's just from my experience, that would have been my a priori assumption. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me politically, it's not an important point. I'm just making a, I'm just saying things to illustrate the, the language, right? Don't take me too seriously. A priori. 
um, in another example, it can be said that any any theoretical foundations or concept that is not uh, by a science is a priori. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, each of the definitions seem to have explained that it's you know science science measures things right and science everything has to be empirical if you can't prove it you know with a formula you've got to be able to measure it you know and and, and so that word empirical talk about empirical science right things that you can measure observe and measure so a priori is saying that you're predicting the results before you've measured it, you know, just based on general principles or experience. So let's 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 look for a few more examples of this. It's there, I have a, uh, a question. Yeah. So this in Spanish, uh, yes, I, I want to ask about the posterior. So all the uh, Latin phrases are applying or are used in all the languages? Because so in Spanish is totally the same. So we say yeah. a priori, a posteriori, ex, ex libri. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the answer to that question is, is I don't know about other languages. I, I, I obviously know the Latin words that are communicated into English, but it's a, it's a definite list. It's not an infinite list. It's not like you can use any piece of Latin in English. You know, there's a there's a there's a defined set that are recognized and used. Um. But Spanish being a Latin language, obviously many of these things will just be in Spanish anyway, yeah, or, yeah. or very similar. So we- Vox Populi is another Vox Populi, Latin phrase. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, right? Yeah. So we, and, and we've done that word in the past. So we, in English, English is a very mongrel language, right? We beg and borrow from every other language, German, Spanish, French a lot, Latin a lot, Greek as well. Like I, I, I remember I was explaining about ignoramus and um, ignoramus is the Latin word and the Greek word is um, agnostic. Yeah. If somebody says, like, I could ask the question, are you religious? You, you could respond, I'm an agnostic. And what you would mean by that is you don't know. A, a, a for opposite, gnostic means no. no right? So you're saying, I don't know. So to that question, the typical answers are, yes, I'm religious, or no, I'm actually an atheist. I, I have a positive belief, not in God, or there's this thing in the middle, which is an agnostic, right? And that is a Greek word, right? It's the same word exactly as ignoramus, so that doesn't sound as polite, <laughs> because we would say ignoramus about somebody who's stupid, right? You know, so people don't normally call themselves an ignoramus. <laughs> but they would call somebody else an ignoramus. But that's exactly the same word. It's just it's in Latin. So we take from Greek as well. So um, a priori is certainly very common. A posteriori, I've never heard used from the earlier or from the later respectively are Latin phrases used in philosophy, 
distinguish types of knowledge, justification or argument in their, in their reliance on empirical evidence or experience. A priori knowledge is that which is independent from experience. Okay, so that's a very good help here, right? It's independent of experience. That's the empirical point we made earlier. Examples include mathematics, tautologies, and deduction from pure reasoning. A posteriori knowledge is that which depends on empirical evidence. Examples include most fields of science and aspects of personal knowledge. So there's an expression I use a lot, right? And that is uh, experiential knowledge, right? So I could have knowledge of something because I read it in a book. So Alan knows that because he read it in the book. But that's not the same as experiential knowledge. Oh, I've actually experienced it. So for example, India, right? India, for anyone who's never been to India, is an amazing country, right? Like if you've never been to India, it's an eye-opening country. Now, I could say, I know about India, I've read a book, right? Or I could say, I have, know about India because I've been there five times. So I have experiential, i.e. experience, I have experiential knowledge. I have no experiential knowledge of Persia, Iran, but I've read a bit about it, but it's not the same. So I have a, I have a little, little, little knowledge but no experiential knowledge. And so I could say, if I was planning a trip to Iran, I could say, a priori, I think. So based on what I know and have read, I can say something, but it's not based on any true experience. A priori. People say in written, a priori is one of those things you see written, you don't hear said. It is said though, but you, you, you come across it much more in written dialogue. I don't hear a posteriori very much, like never, never, but a priori I hear a lot. Okay, so that's been quite a few new words there. That's enough for one evening. Um, so we could do some uh, e expressions now, or we could do a wee job interview. Do you want to do? Do you want to do that? Do you want to? What would you like to do for for the last half hour? What would be most helpful for everybody? Has anyone got any questions? No, sir. No? Okay. Um, Let me look for some expressions. Then that I've got. Yeah, here's one. Couldn't swing a cat in it. Have you ever done that? Couldn't swing a cat. Have you come across that one, Anjali? No. No? No. Okay. All right. Well, this is a very common expression. And uh, I've actually looked up the etymology of this one and nobody is sure where it comes from. Well, everyone knows what it means. And um, some people think that the cat is the thing called the cat and nine tails, which is an old whip. So here's the expression. If you say there's no room to swing a cat or you can't swing a cat, you mean that the place you're talking about is very small and crowded. It was described as a large luxury mobile home, but there was barely room to swing a cat. So 
like everybody imagines grabbing a cat by the tail and then swinging it, but obviously you would never do that with a cat, right? But the cat of nine tails, which was like a, a whip, you used to use to beat your slaves, right? No, no, that's something. Maybe, maybe that's where it comes from. Nobody really knows. But it's the idea of something is really small. Like you, you kind of often use it to do with apartments, you know. Uh, I've got this apartment, but to be honest with you, you couldn't swing a cat in it. Like people say that all the time, quite thinking about it. Couldn't swing a cat in it. And I assume, I assume that you don't have that such an expression in Spanish. I maybe have an equivalent, or in Farsi, do you? Or Hindi? No. Okay, so that's a good one to know, right? Just, Excuse just lock. Me, what was the question? The question was, do you have an equivalent of "couldn't swing a cat"? Oh, I see. Um, I don't have something in my mind. Okay. Okay, okay, so that's one expression. We've learned a new expression. Here's another great one. Mind your P's and Q's. We have done that, done that expression. We did? Yeah. Okay, do you want to educate everybody what it means? Yeah, it's like mind your language, something, mind your words. Mm, you're in the ballpark, not quite right. It really has this idea of mind your manners, right? Mind your language, this is one you touched on, be in your best behavior. So it's something that you would t tell a child when she was, he or she was going out and you wanted them to be well behaved, you would say, mind your P's and Q's, mind your P's and Q's. And again, it's another one of those expressions where people have doubts about the etymology. Um, some people think the P's and Q's is short for please and thank you. You can see that please and thank you, yeah? So when you ask for something, always say please, we teach people never to say, can I have a drink? You always say, please, can I have a drink? We teach children always say please when asking. And we also teach them to say thank you when the thing is given to them. Never to accept it without saying thank you. You're, so please and thank you, please and thank you is good etiquette we drum, absolutely drum into our children in the UK, not in America, <laughs> yeah. not, in, not in North, uh, uh, as in the United States of America, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. So if like the common expression that maybe some parents use when they take their children to the church, for example? Yes. Yeah, but though that's not the best example because in church people would generally be quiet, right? It would be more in, in the situation where they're going to be in company. They're going to somebody's house for dinner and you want to be in your best behavior. Yeah, so we, we bribe kids, you know, we say to them, like, you need to be in your best behavior, otherwise, and we threaten them, right? Otherwise, no more TV for a week <laughs> or, or something like that.
Okay, so that's two new two expressions. Couldn't swing a cat. Mind your P's and Q's. I didn't write that one in the chat. Mind your P's and Q's. And then here's another one on the same page. This is used metaphorically on the same page. Yes, sir. It's when you are agree when you agree with another person. Correct. Something. Excellent. Exactly what it means, right? So we're having a discussion, and if we are on the same page. It's like we're reading a book and we're both reading the same page, right? We're just together, right? We're in agreement. Everybody's on the page, the same page for once, right? We're, we're, we're in agreement. There's an expression like, not unlike this, called singing from the same hymn sheet. Okay? which has got nothing to do with singing in church. <laughs> it's another one of these expressions. If you say that people, especially people in the same organization are singing from the same hymn sheet or singing from the same song sheet, you mean that they're saying the same things in public about something that appeared and appear to agree about it. Now, that's interesting. So the spin, Teacher, yeah. Could you, could you pronounce again that? Singing from the same hymn hem sheet. sheet. Singing, singing from the same hymn sheet. Hymn. Hem hem sheet. Hem. Yeah, it's pronounced the same way, way as him, H I M, like him or her. But a hymn is a, a hymn is a religious song. That you would sing in church, and and so the picture here is is if you have a choir, for them to sing together, they need to have the same hymn sheet. That's an obvious thing, right? So so everyone has to have the same hymn sheet for the choir to sing in harmony, and so that's taken as a metaphor and used in every kind of context in business. And the particular thing here is, is the subtlety and the meaning is you want everybody to be saying the same things publicly. So we're all working in the same organization and we're going to be at a conference and we'll be getting quizzed about we all work for a camera manufacturer, Nikon, and we're going to get asked questions about the upcoming new Z9. So we want to agree ahead of time what we're going to say. Um, are we going to commit a launch date? No. We're going to say the back end of the year. Nobody will say a month and certainly not give a date, even though we have a planning date. We're going to be asked about features. Here, here is a list, and we'll share this list ahead of time, of 80% of the features we're going to talk about. But there's going to be a couple of special features that we're not going to take. We're, not, we're, going, to, we're going to maintain radio silence on these special features to excite the market at the time. And so by doing all of this, we are going to make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Now, that was quite an elaborate explanation of that. And all of that is true. However, we would use this not so formally as this to basically 
say we're in agreement, right? We're on the same page. You know, t quite often, ah, that's good. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet, yeah. But the real, the real meaning is this idea of all agreeing beforehand the salient points. I've used the word there. Often used with this salient points. Salient. The most notable or important. It succinctly covered all the salient points of the case of an angle pointing outwards. Okay. We never use it like that. We always use it like this. The most notable or important. So we in this class are dealing with the salient points of the English language. So I use that word in describing uh, the hymn sheet. So the salient, we've covered the salient points of it. It is also less formal use of it, just to say we're in agreement. Yeah, we're, we're all in agreement. Okay. Everybody got that? No. I'm getting thumbs up from Anjali. Right. So, and Elham. I've got double trouble. Right, here's a very informal expression. Very informal very common, in it, in it. And uh, what does it mean in British slang? If this is British slang, I'm not talking about in it as a demon process that continues to run until the system is shut down. This is a computer jargon, right? I'm not using it like that. I'm using it in the sense of British slang where it is short for, isn't it? So I have just explained something to you and I'm saying that's right, isn't it? Isn't it? I could say that as a sort of rhetorical question, isn't it? You know, when I ask a rhetorical question, I'm not asking for an answer. That's what a rhetorical question is. When you ask a question for effect. Now in Britain and particularly in London, People have this annoying habit of saying in it, in it, in it. So they're, they're saying something to you and they want to really drive home the point and say in it, in it, in it. So I, I'm teaching you this so that you're aware of it. I'm not teaching you to use it to encourage its use, right? Because it sounds gross to me, right? That's in it is short for isn't it, which and isn't it is short for is it not. So, so the obvious unspoken answer to the question is yes. So, you know, you know, I'm a market seller and I'm selling hats and I'm saying, hey, buy my hat. Look at this hat. It's really nice. In it, in it, in it. Look, it's got lovely. Uh, Orange uh, stripes in a lovely badge, great in, in it, in it, in it. Like people really talk like that, you know. <laughs> and by saying in it, in it, in it, I'm expecting you to be saying yes, yes, yes. Okay, you're going to buy it then? It's only going to cost you a fiver. Yeah. So, 
So I'm teaching you some slang. I'll teach you another bit of slang. Um, this is give us, right? Give us, give us, give us. So let me let me let me write that down. Let me write in it in the chat so we we'll captured it. Uh, and now give us, right? No. When we say give us, I'm using the second person plural alert, us, right? Give us. But actually, I don't mean that. What I mean when I say that is, I mean is give me, give me. And an example of this is where you're saying to me, Alan, are you coming now? I could say, give us five minutes, give us five minutes. What am I asking for? I'm saying, give me five minutes. I'll be ready to leave in five minutes. But I don't say, give me five minutes. I say, give us five. But there's no us, there's just me. <laughs> It's just me, right? So give us, and give us is short for give me, give us. Okay, that's slang. And I'll teach you another bit of related slang is geese, geese. Yeah, so I could say geese a call. And give a call is give me a call. That is short for give me a call. Okay. Give a call, give a call, give a call. Okay, so this is all not correct English, but, but people say this. So I'm just teaching you this to make you aware. Like in, in, informally on email, if I couldn't get somebody, I need to talk to them, I would say, He's a call like that. Yeah, or send him a WhatsApp. Say, he's a call. I mean, I want to chat to you. So can you give me a call? Yeah. And you can see that geese there is short for give us a call. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. So when I say give, give a call, so it could be, for example, a, for a personal, I don't know how to say that. So I am referring to myself or also could be referring, for example, if I am with another person and I don't know, all the ones say goodbye and we say, we can say, yeah. okay, uh, don't forget give a call. Yeah. So I mean, it applies for any number of people that is saying yeah. that yes it would certainly apply if there was two of us chatting and somebody was interrupting right and if there's two of us chatting if you and i were sitting chatting and the leader came over and said hey our taxi's outside you want to come i could say give us a moment un momento yeah i could say that now get I could say, give us two minutes, give us two minutes, because let's say the taxi is for me and not for you, but I'm chatting to you and I want to finish what I'm saying to you. So I'll say, give us a minute, just give us a minute. Because uh, uh, I want to finish talking to you. Yeah. I'm not quite finished. We're, we're having a proper tete-a-tete -tete, as we learned last week. A tete-a-tete. -a -tete. Were you in the class and we did tete-a-tete? -tete? You might have missed that one. I think it was in the Eastern one. Okay. So Elham will explain to you what a tet a tet is. <laughs> uh, it was um, uh, a kind of uh, chatting between two or more people uh, uh, when uh, they are like in a party or in, off in the office and they are bent uh, to each other. And yes. uh, it's like uh, the, their body language is uh, uh, 
saying to people that it is a private conversation. Absolutely. Excellent. Could not improve upon that. The only <laughs> thing I would say is it's mostly between two people, like 99.9% .9 of the time it's two. They're having a tete-a-tete. -tete. Look, look at those two having a tete-a-tete. -tete. Now, it's not necessarily a romantic chat, although it could be, but it's not necessarily so. It, it's, but it is private. You can tell by the body language, it's a private chat. You know, they're, yeah, they're talking heads close together. They're talking in such a way that they don't want anybody else to hear what they're saying. Like it could be a family chat, it could be about business, it could be like personal matters. Nobody knows what it's about, right? But they're obviously having a tete a tete. And so if I'm having a tete a tete, and somebody interrupts me, I could say, give us a minute. Give us, I really mean me. Give us one minute, and I'll be right there. Give me one minute, I'll be right there. Okay. I think we're done. <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed that. And I've made the notes. Uh, I will put the chat on the group chat. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but what I started doing is when I post the video on YouTube, I put the words from the chat in the description of the video. So if you look at the description of the video, you'll see the expressions and the grammar and the vocabulary all listed there. So you can quickly see, oh yeah, what we covered there. All right. Well, nice to see you all. I appreciate that would have been tough for you, Philippe, since you're just getting started with English. So it's kind of hard work for you. I understand that. You have my commiserations. To my Spanish friends, I feel I'm making a wee bit of progress on the Spanish. Learned a few new words this week. Necesito. <laughs> Yes, sir. When you when you need any, any help, so uh, without any doubt, you can tell us. All right. Well, when I'm confident enough to have a little bit of a chat, I'll I'll definitely practice and do that for sure. Claro que sí, profe. Okay. All Voy right. a escribirle algunas palabras en español. Sí. Bueno, <laughs> all right, everyone. I bid you all good evening. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thanks a bunch. Bye. <laughs> Thanks a bunch for everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye, teacher. Bye bye, man. Thank you.